Syed Abul Allah Madudi Chishti Urdu, Abilali Maudi Alternative Spellings of Last Name Madudi, Madudi, also known as Abul Allah Madudi, the 25th of September 1903, the 25th of September 1903, the 22nd of September 1979, the 22nd of September 1979, was a Pakistani Muslim philosopher, jurist, journalist, and imam. His numerous works, which covered a range of disciplines such as Quranic exegesis, hadith, law, philosophy and history", were written in Urdu, but then translated into English, Arabic, Hindi, Bengali, Tamil, Burmese and many other languages. He sought to revive Islam, and to propagate what he understood to be, "...true Islam". He believed that Islam was essential for politics, and that it was necessary to institute sharia and preserve Islamic culture from what he viewed as the evils of secularism, nationalism and socialism, which he understood to be the influence Western imperialism. He was the founder of the Jamaat-e-Islami, the then largest Islamic organization in Asia. He and his party are thought to have been the pioneer in politicizing Islam and generating support for an Islamic state in Pakistan. They are thought to have helped inspire General Muhammad Zia ul Haq to introduce Shurization to Pakistan and to have been greatly strengthened by him after tens of thousands of members and sympathizers were given jobs in the judiciary and civil service during his administration. He was the first recipient of the Saudi Arabian King Faisal International Award for his service to Islam in 1979. He has been the second person in history whose absentee funeral was observed in the Kaaba, succeeding King Ashama ibn Abjar. Early life Background Madhudi was born in Aurangabad, India, then part of the princely state enclave of Hyderabad, until it returned to India in 1948. He was the youngest of three sons of Maulana Ahmad Hassan, a lawyer by profession. Although his father was only middle class, he was the descendant of the Chishti line of saints, in fact his last name was derived from the first member of the Chishti Silsila, i.e. Kawaja Syed Qutb ul Din Madud Chishti d. 527 AH. His father's mother was related to Islamic modernist thinker Syed Ahmad Khan. As he himself states, his paternal family originally moved from Chikt, in modern-day Afghanistan, during the days of Sikandar Lodi d. 1517, initially settling in the state of Haryana before moving to Delhi later on, and on his mother's side, his ancestor Mirza Tulik, a soldier of Turkish origin, moved into India from Transoxiana around the times of Emperor Aurangzeb d. 1707, while his maternal grandfather, Mirza Kurban Ali Beg Khan Salik (1816–1881), was a well-known writer and poet in Delhi, a friend of the famous Urdu poet Ghalib. Childhood At an early age, until he was nine, Madhudi was given home education, he "...received religious nurture at the hands of his father and from a variety of teachers employed by him." As his father wanted him to become a Malvi, this education consisted of learning Arabic, Persian, Islamic law and hadith. He also studied books of mantic logic. A precocious child, he translated Qasim Amin's Al-Mara al-Jadida, the new woman, a modernist and feminist work, from Arabic into Urdu at the age of 11. In the field of translation, years later, he also worked on some 3,500 pages from Asfar, a work of Persian mystical thinker Mullah Sadra. His thought would influence Madhudi, as Sadra's notions of rejuvenation of the temporal order, and the necessity of the reign of Islamic law the sharia for the spiritual ascension of man, found an echo in Madhudi's works. <laughs> <laughs> Education When he was 11, Madhudi was admitted to 8th class directly in Madrasa Fakaniya Mashrikiya Oriental High School, Aurangabad, founded by Shibli Namani, a modernist Islamic scholar trying to synthesize traditional Islamic scholarship with modern knowledge, and which awakened Madhudi's long-lasting interest in philosophy particularly from Thomas Arnold, who also taught the same subject to Muhammad Iqbal as well as natural sciences, like mathematics, physics and chemistry. He then moved to a more traditionalist Darul Uloom in Hyderabad. Meanwhile, his father shifted to Bhopal, there Madhudi befriended Niyaz Fatehpuri, another modernist, where he suffered a severe paralysis attack and died leaving no property or money, forcing his son to abort his education. 
In 1919, by the time he was 16, and still a modernist in mindset, he moved to Delhi and read books by his distant relative, the reformist Said Ahmad Khan. He also learned English and German in order to study, intensively, Western philosophy, sociology and history for full five years. He eventually came up to the conclusion that Ulama in the past did not endeavor to discover the causes of Europe's rise, and he offered a long list of philosophers whose scholarship had made Europe a world power – Fichte, Hegel, Comte, Mill, Turgot, Adam Smith, Malthus, Rousseau, Voltaire, Montesquieu, Darwin, Goethe, and Herder, among others. Comparing their contribution to that of Muslims, he concluded that the latters did not reach even 1%. Topic. Journalism Even if he began to get seriously involved in journalism from the early 1920s onwards, being appointed editor of the leading weekly Urdu newspaper Taj of Jubalpur in 1920 at the age of 17, he also resumed his studies as an autodidact in 1921, notably through the influence of some members of the Jamiat ulema e hind by studying the Dars-e-Nizami and subjects such as Adab literature, Mantic logic, and Kalam theology and philosophy, Madhudi got Ijazas certificates and diplomas in traditional Islamic learning but never called himself an alim in the formal sense because he found the Islamic scholars to be regressive, even though some Diobandi influence on him would remain, I do not have the prerogative to belong to the class of ulema. I am a man of the middle cadre, who has imbibed something from both the systems of education, the new and the old, and has gathered my knowledge by traversing both paths. By virtue of my inner light, I conclude that neither the old school nor the new is totally in the right. From 1924 to 1927 Madhudi was the editor of al Jamia, the newspaper of the jamiat i ulama an organization of Islamic clergy, a position of extreme importance and influence. Always interested in independence from the British, Madhudi lost faith in the Congress party and its Muslim allies in the 1920s as the party developed an increasingly Hindu identity. He began to turn more towards Islam, and believed that democracy could be a viable option for Muslims only if the majority of Indians were Muslim. Madhudi spent some time in Delhi as a young man but went back to Hyderabad in 1928. Topic. Political writings It was from 1933 to 1941 that Madhudi's most important and influential Works were published, according to scholar Sayyid Vali Nasser. Nasser describes his role at the time as a ideologue, rather than a journalist he was earlier, or the political activist he became after founding his party. In 1932 he joined another journal and from 1932 to 1937 he began to develop his political ideas, and turn towards the cause of Islamic revivalism and Islam as an ideology, as opposed to what he called traditional and hereditary religion." The government of Hyderabad helped support the journal buying 300 subscriptions which it donated to libraries around India. Madhudi was alarmed by the decline of Muslim-ruled Hyderabad, the increasing secularism and lack of purdah among Muslim women in Delhi. By 1937 he became in conflict with Jamiat ulema e hind and its support for a pluralistic Indian society where the Jamiat hoped Muslims could thrive without sacrificing their identity or interests." In that year he also married Mahmuda Begum, a woman from an old Muslim family with "...considerable financial resources." The family provide financial help and allowed him to devote himself to research and political action, but his wife had "...liberated," modern ways, and at first rode a bicycle and did not observe purda. She was given greater latitude by Madhudi than were other Muslims. Topic. Political activity At this time he also began work on establishing an organization for dawah propagation and preaching of Islam that would be an alternative to both the Indian National Congress and the Muslim League. At this time he decided to leave Hyderabad for northwest India, closer to the Muslim political center of gravity in India. In 1938, after meeting the famous Muslim poet Muhammad Iqbal, Madhudi moved to a piece of land in the village of Pathankot in the Punjab to oversee a waqf Islamic foundation called Darul Islam. His hope was to make it a nerve center of Islamic revival in India, an ideal religious community, providing leaders and the foundation for a genuine religious movement. 
He wrote to various Muslim luminaries invited them to join him there. The community, like Jamaat-i-Islami later, was composed of Rukan members, a shura a consultative council, and a sadr head. After a dispute with the person who donated the land for the community over Madhudi's anti-nationalist politics, Madhudi quit the WAQF and in 1939 moved the Darul Islam with its membership from Pathankot to Lahore. In Lahore he was hired by Islamia College but was sacked after less than a year for his openly political lectures. Topic. Founding the Jamaat-i-Islami In August 1941, Madhudi founded Jamaat-i-Islami in British India as a religious political movement to promote Islamic values and practices. His mission was supported by eminent scholars such as Maulana Amin Asan Islahi, Mulana Muhammad Manzor Naumani, Maulana Abul Hassan Ali Nudvi and Maulana Naeem Siddiqui. Madhudi proposed forming a Muslim state based on Islamic law and in which Islam would guide all areas of life. This state would not be theocracy, Madhudi held, but a theodemocracy, because its rule would be based on the entire Muslim community, not the ulema, Islamic scholars. Initially, Madhudi opposed the creation of a separate Muslim state in the subcontinent. As G. Amir leader, he opposed the leaders of the Muslim League who sought an independent Muslim majority state. He believed that an Islamic state is a Muslim state, but a Muslim state may not be an Islamic state unless and until the constitution of the state is based on the Quran and Sunnah. In particular, he opposed the Pakistani state allowing conventional banking and giving too many rights to minorities and Muslim sects such as the Ahmadiyya he considered heretical. Topic: <laughs> After founding of Pakistan With the partition of India in 1947, the G was split to follow the political boundaries of new countries carved out of British India. The organisation headed by Madhudi became known as Jamaat-i-Islami Pakistan, and the remnant of G in India as the Jamaat-e-Islami Hind. Later G parties were the Bangladesh Jamaat-e-Islami, and autonomous groups in Indian Kashmir. With the founding of Pakistan, Madhudi's career underwent a fundamental change being drawn more and more into politics, and spending less time on ideological and scholarly pursuits. Although his Jamaat-i-Islami party never developed a mass following, it and Madhudi did develop significant political influence. It played a prominent part in the agitation which brought down President Ayub Khan in 1969 and in the overthrow of Prime Minister Zulfikar Ali Bhutto in 1977. Madhudi and the G were especially influential in the early years of General Zia ul Haq's rule. His political activity, particularly in support of the creation of an Islamic state, clashed with the government, dominated for many years by a secular political class, and resulted in several arrests and periods of incarceration. The first was in 1948 when he and several other G leaders were jailed after Madhudi objected to the government's clandestine sponsorship of jihad in Kashmir while professing to observe a ceasefire with India. In 1951 and again in 1956 7, the compromises involved in electoral politics led to a split in the party over what some members felt were a lowering of G's moral standards. In 1951, the G Shura passed a resolution in support of the party withdrawing from politics, while Madhudi argued for continued involvement. Madhudi prevailed at an open party meeting in 1951, and several senior G leaders resigned in protest, further strengthened Madhudi's position and beginning the growth of a cult of personality around him. Quote, in 1957 Madhudi again overruled the vote of the Shura to withdraw from electoral politics. In 1953, he and the G participated in a campaign against the Ahmadiyya community in Pakistan. Anti-Ahmadi groups argued that the Ahmadiyya did not embrace Muhammad as the last prophet. Madhudi as well as the traditionalist ulama of Pakistan wanted Ahmadi designated as non-Muslims, Ahmadis such as Muhammad Zafarullah Khan sacked from all high-level government positions, and intermarriage between Ahmadis and other Muslims prohibited. The campaign generated riots in Lahore, leading to the deaths of at least 200 Ahmadis, and selective declaration of martial law. Madhudi was arrested by the military deployment headed by Lieutenant General Azam Khan and sentenced to death for his part in the agitation. However, the anti Ahmadi campaign enjoyed much popular support, and strong public pressure ultimately convinced the government to release him after two years of imprisonment. 
According to Vali Nasser, Madhudi's unapologetic and impassive stance after being sentenced, ignoring advice to ask for clemency, had an immense effect on his supporters. It was seen as a victory of Islam over un Islam. Proof of his leadership and staunch faith, the campaign shifted the focus of national politics towards Islamicity. The 1956 constitution was adopted after accommodating many of the demands of the G. Madhudi endorsed the constitution and claimed it a victory for Islam, however following a coup by General Ayub Khan, the constitution was shelved and Madhudi and his party were politically repressed, Madhudi being imprisoned in 1964 and again in 1967. The G joined an opposition alliance with secular parties, compromising with doctrine to support a woman candidate Fatima Jinnah for president against Khan in 1965. In the December 1970 general election, Madhudi toured the country as a leader in waiting and G spent considerable energy and resources fielding 151 candidates. Despite this, the party won only four seats in the National Assembly and four in the Provincial Assemblies. The loss led Madhudi to withdraw from political activism in 1971 and return to scholarship. In 1972 he resigned as G's Amir leader for reasons of health. However it was shortly thereafter that Islamism gathered steam in Pakistan in the form of the Nizam-i-Mustafa Order of the Prophet movement, an alliance of conservative political groups united against Zulfikar Ali Bhutto which the G gave shape to and which bolstered its standing. In 1977, Madhudi returned to the center stage. When Bhutto attempted to defuse tensions on 16 April 1977, he came to Madhudi's house for consultations. When General Muhammad Zia ul Haq overthrew Bhutto and came to power in 1977, he accorded Madhudi the status of a senior statesman, sought his advice, and allowed his words to adorn the front pages of the newspapers. Madhudi proved receptive to Zia's overtures and supported his decision to execute Bhutto. Despite some doctrinal difference, Madhudi wanted Sharia by education rather than by state fiat. Madhudi enthusiastically supported Zia and his program of Islamization or Shurization. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Beliefs and ideology. Madhudi poured his energy into books, pamphlets and more than 1,000 speeches and press statements, laying the groundwork for making Pakistan an Islamic state, but also dealing with a variety of issues of interest in Pakistan and the Muslim world. He sought to be a mujadid, renewing, tajdid, the religion. This role had great responsibility as he believed a mujadid, on the whole, has to undertake and perform the same kind of work as is accomplished by a prophet. While earlier Mujadids had renewed religion he wanted also to propagate true Islam, the absence of which accounted for the failure of earlier efforts at Tajdid. According to at least one biographer Vali Nasser, Madhudi and the G moved away from some of their more controversial doctrinal ideas e.g. criticism of Sufism or the ulama and closer to orthodox Islam over the course of his career, in order to expand the base of support of Jama'i-Islami. Quran Madhudi believed that the Quran was not just religious literature to be recited, pondered, or investigated for hidden truths, according to Vali Nasser, but a socio religious institution, a work to be accepted at face value and obeyed. By implementing its prescriptions, the ills of societies would solve. It pitted truth and bravery against ignorance, falsehood, and evil. The Quran is a book which contains a message, an invitation, which generates a movement. The moment it began to be sent down, it impelled a quiet and pious man to raise his voice against falsehood, and pitted him in a grim struggle against the lords of disbelief, evil and iniquity. It drew every pure and noble soul, and gathered them under the banner of truth. In every part of the country, it made all the mischievous and the corrupt to rise and wage war against the bearers of the truth. 
In his tafsir Quranic interpretation Tafhimul Quran, he introduced the four interrelated concepts he believed essential to understanding the Quran, ilah divinity, rab lord, backquote ibada worship, meaning not the cherishing or praising of God but acting out absolute obedience to him, and din religion. Islam Madhudi saw Muslims not simply as those who followed the religion of Islam, but as almost everything, because obedience to divine law is what defines a Muslim. Everything in the universe is Muslim for it obeys Allah by submission to his laws. The laws of the physical universe, that the heaven is above earth, that night follows day, etc., were as much a part of Sharia as banning consumption of alcohol and interest on debts. Thus it followed that stars, planets, oceans, rocks, atoms, etc. should actually be considered Muslims, since they obey their creator's laws. Rather than Muslims being a minority among humans, one religious group among many, it is non-Muslims who are a small minority among everything in the universe. Of all creatures only humans and jinn are endowed with free will, and only non-Muslim humans and jinn choose to use that will to disobey the laws of their creator, but in rejecting Islam Madhudi believed the non-Muslim struggled against truth. His very tongue which, on account of his ignorance advocates the denial of God or professes multiple deities, is in its very nature Muslim. The man who denies God is called kafir concealer because he conceals by his disbelief what is inherent in his nature and embalmed in his own soul. His whole body functions in obedience to that instinct. Reality becomes estranged from him and he in the dark. Since a Muslim is one who obeys divine law, simply having made a shahada declaration of belief in the oneness of God and the acceptance of Muhammad as God's prophet or being born into a Muslim family does not make you a Muslim nor is seeking knowledge of God, part of the religion of Islam. The Muslim is a slave of God, and absolute obedience to God is a fundamental right of God. The Muslim does not have the right to choose a way of life for himself or assume whatever duties he likes. Madhudi believed that Islam covered all aspects of life. Islam is not a religion in the sense this term is commonly understood. It is a system encompassing all fields of living. Islam means politics, economics, legislation, science, humanism, health, psychology and sociology. It is a system which makes no discrimination on the basis of race, color, language or other external categories. Its appeal is to all mankind. It wants to reach the heart of every human being. Of all these aspects of Islam, Madhudi was primarily interested in culture preserving Islamic dress, language and customs, from what he believed were the dangers of women's emancipation, secularism, nationalism, etc. It was also important to separate the realm of Islam from non-Islam, to form boundaries around Islam. It would also be proven scientifically Madhudi believed that Islam would eventually emerge as the world religion to cure man of all his maladies. But what many Muslims, including many ulama, considered Islam, Madhudi did not. Madhud complained that, not more than 0.001% of Muslim knew what Islam actually was. Madhudi not only idealized the first years of Muslim society Muhammad and the rightly guided caliphs but considered what came after to be un-Islamic or jahiliya, with the exception of brief religious revivals. Muslim philosophy, literature, arts, mysticism were syncretic and impure, diverting attention from the divine. Topic. Hadith Madhudi had a unique perspective on the transmission of hadith, the doings and sayings of the Islamic prophet Muhammad, that form part of the basis of Islamic law. Rather than basing judgment of the quality of a hadith on the number and reliability of the chain of transmission known as isnad, hadith were passed on orally before being written down and the judgments of generations of muhadithan. Hadith scholars, Madhudi believed in his intuition, and that, with extensive study and practice one can develop a power and can intuitively sense the wishes and desires of the Holy Prophet. Thus, on seeing a hadith, I can tell whether the Holy Prophet could or could not have said it. Women 
According to Irfan Ahmad, while Madhudi opposed all Western influence in Islam, he saw women's visibility in the bazaar, colleges, theatres, restaurants, as the greatest threat to morality. Art, literature, music, film, dance, use of makeup by women, all were shrieking signs of immorality. Madhudi preached that the duty of women is to manage the household, bring up children, and provide them and her husband with the greatest possible comfort and contentment. Madhudi supported the complete veiling and segregation of women as practiced in most of Muslim India of his time. Women, he believed, should remain in their homes except when absolutely necessary. The only room for argument he saw in the matter of veiling, hijab was, whether the hands and the face of women were to be covered or left uncovered. On this question Madhudi came down on the side of the complete covering of women's faces whenever they left their homes. Concerning the separation of the genders, he preached that men should avoid looking at women other than their wives, mothers, sisters, etc. Maram, much less trying to make their acquaintance. He opposed birth control and family planning as a rebellion against the laws of nature and a reflection of loss of faith in God, who is the planner of human population, and unnecessary because population growth leads to economic development. Muhammad Najachala Siddiqui writes, as to the argument that family planning enables better nourishment and education of children, Madhudi refers to the beneficial effects of adversity and want on human character. Madhudi opposed allowing women to be either a head of state or a legislator, since, according to Islam, active politics and administration are not the field of activity of the womenfolk. They would be allowed to elect their own all-woman legislature which the men's legislature should consult on all matters concerning women's welfare. Their legislature would also have the full right to criticize matters relating to the general welfare of the country, though not to vote on them. Topic. Music Madhudi saw music and dancing as social evils. In describing the wickedness that comes of ignoring Islamic law he included not only leaving the poor to starvation and destitution, while wallowing in luxury, liquor and drugs, but having a regular need for music, satisfied with musicians, dancing girls, drum beaters and manufacturers of musical instruments. Topic. Economics His 1941 lecture, The Economic Problem of Man and Its Islamic Solution, is generally considered to be one of the founding document of modern Islamic economics. Madhudi has been called the leader of the vanguard of contemporary Islamic orthodoxy in Reba and Finance and credited with laying down the foundations for development of Islamic economics. However, Madhudi believed Islam does not concern itself with the modes of production and circulation of wealth and was primarily interested in cultural issues rather than socio-economic ones. Madhudi dismissed the need for a new science of economics, embodied in voluminous books, with high-sounding terminology and large organization, or other experts and specialists, which he believed to be one of the many calamities of modern age. One of the major fallacies of economics was that it regarded as foolish and morally reprehensible spending all that one earns, and everyone is told that he should save something out of his income and have his savings deposited in the bank or purchase an insurance policy or invest it in stocks and shares of joint stock companies. In fact, the practice of saving and not spending some income is ruinous for humanity. But since Islam was a complete system, it included a sharia-based economic program, comparable and of course, superior to other economic systems. Capitalism was a satanic economic system, starting with the fact that it called for the postponement of some consumption in favor of investment. This led to overproduction and a downward spiral of lower wages, protectionism, trade wars and desperate attempts to export surplus production and capital through imperialist invasions of other countries, finally ending in the destruction of the whole society as every learned economist knows. On the other hand, socialism—by putting control of the means and distribution of production in the hands of the government—concentrates power to such an extent it inevitably leads to enslavement of the masses. 
Socialists sought to end economic exploitation and poverty by structural changes and putting an end to private ownership of production and property. But in fact poverty and exploitation is caused not by the profit motive but by the lack of virtue and public welfare among the wealthy, which in turn comes from a lack of adherence to Sharia law. In an Islamic society, greed, selfishness and dishonesty would be replaced by virtue, eliminating the need for the state to make any significant intervention in the economy. According to Madhudi, this system would strike a golden mean between the two extremes of laissez-faire capitalism and a regimented socialist, communist society, embodying all of the virtues and none of the vices of the two inferior systems. It would not be some kind of mixed economy, social democratic compromise, because by following Islamic law and banning alcohol, pork, adultery, music, dancing, interest on loans, gambling, speculation, fraud, and other similar things, it would be distinct and superior to all other systems. Before the economy, like the government, and other parts of society, could be Islamized, an Islamic revolution through education would have to take place to develop this virtue and create support for total Sharia law. This put Madhudi at a political disadvantage with populist and socialist programs because his solution was neither immediate nor tangible. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Banning interest. Of all the elements of Islamic laws dealing with property and money, payment of zakat and other Islamic taxes, etc., Madhudi emphasized the elimination of interest on loans, riba, according to one scholar, because in British India Hindus dominated the money lending trade. Madhudi opposed any and all interest on loans as unislamic riba. He taught that there is hardly a country of the world in which moneylenders and banks are not sucking the blood of poor laboring classes, farmers, and low income groups. A major portion of the earning of a working man is expropriated by the moneylenders, leaving the poor man with hardly enough money to feed himself and his family. While the Quran forbid many sins, it saved its severest terms of punishment, according to Madhudi, for use of interest, he believed there was no such thing as a low, reasonable rate of interest, and that even the smallest and apparently harmless form of interest was intolerable in Islam as rates would inevitably increase over time when the capitalists moneylenders squeezed the entrepreneurs borrowers eliminating any entrepreneurial profit. To replace interest-based finance he proposed direct equity investment, profit and loss sharing, which he asserted would favor societally profitable ventures such as low-income housing that conventional finance ignores in favor of commercially profitable ones. To eliminate the charging of interest he proposed penal punishment with the death penalty for repeat offenders. Critics Faisal Khan complain that Madhudi had no training as an economist and his description of interest-based finance resembles that of the dynamic between South Asian peasant and village moneylender rather than between modern conventional bank and borrower, and further that Madhudi gives no explanation why direct equity finance would lead to any more investment in what is good for society but not commercially profitable than interest-based lending has. Topic. Socialism and populism Unlike Islamists like Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, Madhudi had a visceral antipathy to socialism, which he spent much time denouncing as godless, as well as being unnecessary and redundant in the face of the Islamic State. A staunch defender of the rights of property he warned workers and peasants that you must never take the exaggerated view of your rights which the protagonists of class war present before you." He also did not believe in intervention in the economy to provide universal employment. Islam does not make it binding on society to provide employment for each and every one of its citizens, since this responsibility cannot be accepted without thorough nationalization of the country's resources. Madhudi held to this position despite his florid denunciations of how the rich were sucking the blood and enslaving the poor, the popularity of populism among many Pakistanis, and despite the poverty and vast gap between rich and poor in Pakistan, which is often described as feudal jagardari in its large landholdings and rural poverty. Madhudi openly opposed land reform proposals for Punjab by Prime Minister Liaquat Ali Khan in the 1950s, going so far as to justify feudalism by pointing to Islam's protection of property rights. He later softened his views, extolling economic justice and equity but not egalitarianism, but cautioned the government against tampering with lawful jaggardari 
and continuing to emphasize the sanctity of private property. Topic: <laughs> Islamic Modernism. Madhudi believed that Islam supported modernization but not westernization. He agreed with Islamic modernists that Islam contained nothing contrary to reason, and that it was superior in rational terms to all other religious systems. He disagreed with their practice of examining the Quran and the Sunnah using reason as the standard, instead of starting from the proposition that, "...true reason is Islamic," and accepting the book and the Sunnah, rather than reason, as the final authority. He also took a narrow view of ijihad, limiting the authority to use it to those with thorough grounding in Islamic sciences, faith in the sharia, and then only to serve the needs of his vision of an Islamic state. At the same time, one scholar, Maryam Jamila, has noted the extensive use of modern, non traditionally Islamic ideas and Western idioms and concepts in Madhudi's thought. Islam was a revolutionary ideology and a dynamic movement. The Jama'i Islami, was a party, the Sharia a complete code in Islam's total scheme of life. His enthusiasm for Western idioms and concepts was infectious among those who admired him, encouraging them to implement in Pakistan all his manifestos, quote, comma, quote, programs, and schemes to usher in a true Islamic renaissance. Topic. Mughal Empire Abul Allah Madhudi, condemned the religious ideas of Mughal Emperor Akbar controversially known as the din e alai or, religion of God, as a form of apostasy. Contemporary scholars such as S. M. Ikram argue that Akbar's true intentions were to create an eradit or maridi discipleship and not a new religion. Topic. Secularism Madhudi did not see secularism as a way for the state, government to dampen tensions and divisions in multi-religious societies by remaining religiously neutral and avoid choosing sides. Rather, he believed, it removed religion from society he translated secularism into Urdu as Ladin, literally, religionless. Since, he believed, all morality came from religion, this would necessarily mean, the exclusion of all morality, ethics, or human decency from the controlling mechanisms of society. It was to avoid the restraints of morality and divine guidance, and not out of pragmatism or some higher motive, that some espoused secularism. Science Madhudi believed, modern science was a body that could accommodate any spirit philosophy or value system, just as radio could broadcast Islamic or Western messages with equal facility. Topic. Nationalism Madhudi strongly opposed the concept of nationalism, believing it to be shirk polytheism, and a Western concept which divided the Muslim world and thus prolonged the supremacy of Western imperialist powers. After Pakistan was formed, Madhudi and the G forbade Pakistanis to take an oath of allegiance to the state until it became Islamic, arguing that a Muslim could in clear conscience render allegiance only to God. Topic. Ulama Madhudi also criticized traditionalist clergy or ulama for their moribund, scholastic style, servile, political attitudes, and ignorance of the modern world. Quote dot. He believed traditional scholars were unable to distinguish the fundamentals of Islam from the details of its application, built up in elaborate structures of medieval legal schools of fiqh Islamic jurisprudence. To rid Islam of these obscure laws Muslims should return to the Quran and Sunnah, ignoring judgments made after the reign of the first four rightfully guided caliphs al -kulaf -u -r -rashidun of Islam. Madhudi also believed there would be little need for the traditional role of ulama as leaders, judges, and guardians of the community in a reformed and rationalized Islamic order. 
where those trained in modern as well as traditional subjects would practice ijihad and where Muslims were educated properly in Arabic, the Quran, Hadith, etc. However, over time Madhudi became more orthodox in his attitudes, including toward the ulama, and at times allied himself and his party with them after the formation of Pakistan. Topic. Sufism and popular Islam Like other contemporary revivalists, Madhudi was critical of Sufism and its historical influence in the early days. But he also went on record denying any antagonism towards Sufism by himself or the Jama'ah. According to at least one biographer, this change in position was a result of the importance of Sufism in Pakistan not only among the Muslim masses but the ulama as well. At that time, Madhudi distinguished between the Sufism of sheikhs like Alauddin Shah which he approved of and the shrines, festivals, and rituals of popular Sufism which he did not. He also redefined Sufism, describing it not in the traditional sense as the form and spirit of an esoteric dimension of Islam, but as the way to measure concentration and morals in religion, saying for example, when we say our prayers, fiqh will judge us only by fulfillment of the outward requirements such as ablution, facing toward the Kaaba, while tasawwuf Sufism will judge our prayers by our concentration, the effect of our prayers on our morals and manners. From the mid 1960s onward, redefinition of Islam increasingly gave way to outright recognition of Sufism. And after Madhudi's death the G. Amir Qazi Hussain Ahmad went so far as to visit the Sufi Dada Durbar Shrine in Lahore in 1987 as part of a tour to generate mass support for G. Sharia Madhudi believed that Sharia was not just a crucial command that helped define what it meant to be a Muslim, but something without which a Muslim society could not be Islamic. That if an Islamic society consciously resolves not to accept the Sharia, and decides to enact its own constitution and laws or borrow them from any other source in disregard of the Sharia, such a society breaks its contract with God and forfeits its right to be called Islamic. Many unbelievers agreed that God was the Creator, what made them unbelievers was their failure to submit to His will, i.e. to God's law. Obedience to God's law or will was the historical controversy that Islam has awakened. Throughout the world, it brought not only heavenly reward, but earthly blessing. Failure to obey, or rebellion, against it, brought not only eternal punishment, but evil and misery here on earth. The source of Sharia, was to be found not only in the Quran but also in the Sunnah the doings and sayings of the Islamic prophet Muhammad, since the Quran proclaimed, Whoever obeys the messenger i.e. Muhammad obeys Allah. Quran 4-80 Sharia was perhaps most famous for calling for the abolition of interest-bearing banks, had penalties such as flogging and amputation for alcohol consumption, theft, fornication, adultery and other crimes. Had penalties have been criticized by westernized Muslims as cruel and in violation of international human rights but Madhudi argued that any cruelty was far outweighed by the cruelty in the West that resulted from the absence of these punishments, and in any case would not be applied until Muslims fully understood the teachings of their faith and lived in an Islamic state, but in fact Sharia was much more than these laws. It recognizes no division between religion and other aspects of life, in Madhudi's view, and there was no area of human activity or concern which the Sharia did not address with specific divine guidance. Family relationships, social and economic affairs, administration, rights and duties of citizens, judicial system, laws of war and peace and international relations. In short it embraces all the various departments of life. The Sharia is a complete scheme of life and an all-embracing social order where nothing is superfluous and nothing lacking. A very large part of Sharia required the coercive power and authority of the state for its enforcement. Consequently, while a state based on Islam has a legislature which the ruler must consult, its function is really that of law-finding, not of law-making. At the same time, Madhudi states, somewhat astonishingly, According to one scholar, there is yet another vast range of human affairs about which Sharia is totally silent, and which an Islamic state may write independent legislation. According to scholar Vali Nasser, Madhudi believed that the Sharia needed to be 
streamlined, reinterpreted, and expanded to address questions of governance to the extent required for a state to function. For example, Sharia needed to make clear the relation between the various branches of government. Topic: <laughs> Islamic Revolution. Though the phrase Islamic Revolution is commonly associated with the 1979 Iranian Revolution, or General Zia's Islamization, Madhudi coined and popularized it in the 1940s. The process Madhudi envisioned changing the hearts and minds of individuals from the top of society downward through an educational process or dawah was very different than what happened in Iran, or under Zia ul Haq. Madhudi talked of Islam being a revolutionary ideology and a revolutionary practice which aims at destroying the social order of the world totally and rebuilding it from scratch," but opposed sudden change, violent or unconstitutional action, and was uninterested in grassroots organizing or socio-economic changes. His «revolution» would be achieved «step by step» with «patience» since «the more sudden a change, the more short-lived it is». He warned against the emotionalism of demonstrations or agitations, flag waving, slogans, impassioned speeches, or the like. He believed that societies are built, structured, and controlled from the top down by conscious manipulation of those in power, not by grassroots movements. The revolution would be carried out by training a cadre of pious and dedicated men who would lead and then protect the Islamic revolutionary process. To facilitate this far-reaching program of cultural change, his party invested heavily in producing and disseminating publications. Madhudi was committed to nonviolent legal politics, even if the current methods of struggle takes a century to bear fruit. In 1957, he outlined a new Jama'a policy declaring that transformation of the political order through unconstitutional means," was against Sharia law. Even when he and his party were repressed by the Ayub Khan or People's Party in 1972 governments, Madhudi kept his party from clandestine activity. It was not until he retired as Amir of G that G and Jamiat e Tulaba became more routinely involved in violence. The objective of the revolution was to be justice ADL and benevolence Isan, but the injustice and wrong to be overcome that he focused on was immorality and forbidden behavior Madhudi was interested in ethical changes, rather than socio-economic changes of the sort that drive most historical revolutions and revolutionary movements. He did not support these, for example, opposing land reform in the 1950s as an encroachment on property rights and believed the problems they addressed would be solved by the Islamic State established by the revolution. All this left at least one commentator, Vali Nasser, to wonder if Mahdi had any actual interest in revolution or ideology or saw them simply as buzzwords necessary to indicate commitment to progress, justice, and political idealism in the anti-colonialist political milieu of 20th century South Asia. Topic: <inaudible> Islamic State. The modern conceptualization of the Islamic State is also attributed to Madhudi. This term was coined and popularized in his book The Islamic Law and Constitution 1941 and in subsequent writings. Madhudi's Islamic State is both ideological and all-embracing, based on Islamic democracy, and will eventually rule the earth. In 1955 he described it as a God-worshipping democratic caliphate, founded on the guidance vouchsafed to us through Muhammad. Ultimately though, Islam was more important and the state would be judged by its adherence to din religion and the Islamic system and not democracy. Unlike the Islamic state of Ayatollah Khomeini, it would not establish and enforce Islamization, but follow the Islamization of society. As Madhudi became involved in politics, this vision was relegated to a distant utopia. Three principles underlying it, Tawhid oneness of God, Rizala prophethood, and Khilafah caliphate. The sphere of activity covered by the islamic state would be coextensive with human life in such a state no one can regard any field of his affairs as personal and private 
The Islamic State recognizes the sovereignty of God, which meant God was the source of all law. The Islamic State acts as the vicegerent or agent of God on earth Quran and enforces Islamic law, which is mentioned above as both all-embracing and totally silent on a vast range of human affairs. While the government follows the Sharia law, when it comes to a question about which no explicit injunction is to be found in the Sharia, the matter is settled by consensus among the Muslims. The state can be called a caliphate, but the caliph would not be the traditional descendant of the Quraysh tribe but Madhudi believed the entire Muslim community, a popular vicegerency. Although there would also be an individual leader chosen by the Muslim community, thus the state would be not a theocracy, but a theodemocracy. Madhudi believed that the sovereignty of God and the sovereignty of the people are mutually exclusive. Sovereignty of human beings is simply the domination of man by man, the source of most human misery and calamity. Governance based on sovereignty other than that of gods does not just lead to inferior governance and injustice and maladministration, but evil. Therefore, while Madhudi used the term democracy to describe his state, in part to appeal to westernized Muslim intellectuals, his Islamic democracy was to be the antithesis of secular Western democracy which transfers Hakimiya God's sovereignty to the people, who may pass laws without regard for God's commands. The Islamic State would conduct its affairs by mutual consultation shura among all Muslims. The means of consultation should suit the conditions of the particular time and place but must be free and impartial. While the government follows the Sharia law, when it comes to a question about which no explicit injunction is to be found in the Sharia, the matter is settled by consensus among the Muslims. Madhudi favored giving the state exclusive right to the power of declaring jihad and ijihad, establishing an Islamic law through independent reasoning, traditionally the domain of the ulama. Rights while no aspect of life was to be considered personal and private and the danger of foreign influence and conspiracies was ever present nationalism for example was a western concept which divided the muslim world and thus prolonged the supremacy of western imperialist powers there would also be personal freedom and no suspicion of government madhudi's time spent in jail as a political prisoner led him to have a personal interest in individual rights due process of law and freedom of political expression madhudi stated this espionage on the life of the individual cannot be justified on moral grounds by the government saying that it is necessary to know the secrets of the dangerous persons. This is exactly what Islam has called as the root cause of mischief in politics. The injunction of the Prophet is, When the ruler begins to search for the causes of dissatisfaction amongst his people, he spoils them. Abu Dawud However, the basic human right in Islamic law was to demand an Islamic order and to live in it. Not included were any rights to differ with its rulers and defy its authority. Islamic constitution According to Madhudi, Islam had an unwritten constitution that needed to be transformed into a written one. The constitution would not be the Sharia or the Quran, as Saudi Arabia's constitution is alleged to be, but a religious document based on conventions of the rightly guided caliphs and the canonized verdicts of recognized jurists i.e. the sharia as well as the quran and hadith model of government and expanding on what the government of an islamic state should look like in his book the islamic law and constitution madhudi took as his model the government of muhammad and the first four caliphs al kulaf ur rashidun the head of state should be the supreme head of legislature, executive and judiciary alike, but under him these three organs should function separately and independently of one another. This head of state should be elected and must enjoy the country's confidence, but he is not limited to terms in office. No one is allowed to nominate him for the office, nor to engage in electioneering or run for office, according to another source. Because more than one correct position could not exist. Pluralism i.e. competition between political views, parties, would not be allowed, and there would be only one party. On the other hand, Madhudi believed the state had no need to govern in the Western sense of the term, since the government and citizenry would abide by the same infallible and inviolable divine law. Power would not corrupt and no one would feel oppressed. Power and resources would be distributed fairly. 
There would be no grievances, no mass mobilizations, demands for political participation, or any other of the turmoil of non-Islamic governance. Since the Prophet had told early Muslims, My community will never agree on an error. There was no need for establishing concrete procedures and mechanisms for popular consultation, since the state would be defined by its ideology not by boundaries or ethnicity its raison d'etre and protector would be ideology, the purity of which must be protected against any efforts to subvert it. Naturally, it must be controlled and run exclusively by Muslims, and not just any Muslims but only those who believe in the ideology on which it is based and in the divine law which it is assigned to administer. The state's legislature should consist of a body of such learned men who have the ability and the capacity to interpret Quranic injunctions and who in giving decisions, would not take liberties with the spirit or the letter of the sharia. Their legislation would be based on the practice of ijihad a source of Islamic law, relying on careful analogical reasoning, using both the Quran and Hadith, to find a solution to a legal problem, making it more a legal organ than a political one. They must also be persons who enjoy the confidence of the masses. They may be chosen by the modern system of elections, or by some other method which is appropriate to the circumstances and needs of modern times. Since upright character is essential for office holders and desire for office represents greed and ambition, anyone actively seeking an office of leadership would be automatically disqualified. Non Muslims or women may not be a head of state but could vote for separate legislators. Originally, Madhudi envisioned a legislature only as a consultative body, but later proposed using a referendum to deal with possible conflicts between the head of state and the legislature, with the loser of the referendum resigning. Another later rule was allowing the formation of parties and factions during elections of representatives but not within the legislature. In the judiciary, Madhudi originally proposed the inquisitional system where judges implement law without discussion or interference by lawyers, which he saw as un Islamic. After his party was rescued from government repression by the Pakistani judiciary, he changed his mind, supporting autonomy of the judiciary and accepting the adversarial system and right of appeal. Topic. Failure of Western democracy Secular Western representative democracy—despite its free elections and civil rights—is a failure Madhudi believed for two reasons. Because secular society has «divorced» politics and religion Madhudi believed, its leaders have «ceased to attach much or any importance to morality and ethics» and so ignore their constituents' interests and the common good. Furthermore, without Islam, the common people are incapable of perceiving their own true interests. An example being the prohibition law in the United States, where despite the fact that it had been rationally and logically established that drinking is injurious to health, produces deleterious disorder in human society. Madhudi states, the law banning alcohol consumption was repealed by the American Congress. Non-Muslims Madhudi believed that copying cultural practices of non-Muslims was forbidden in Islam, having very disastrous consequences upon a nation, it destroys its inner vitality, blurs its vision, befogs its critical faculties, breeds inferiority complexes, and gradually but assuredly saps all the springs of culture and sounds its death knell. That is why the Holy Prophet has positively and forcefully forbidden the Muslims to assume the culture and mode of life of the non-Muslims. He was appalled at what he saw as the satanic flood of female liberty and license which threatens to destroy human civilization in the West. Madhudi strongly opposed the small Ahmadiyya sect, a Muslim sect which Madhudi and many other Muslims do not consider as Muslim. He preached against Ahmadiyya in his pamphlet The Qadiani Question and the book The Finality of Prophethood. Under the Islamic State the rights of non-Muslims are limited under Islamic State as laid out in Madhudi's writings. Although non-Muslim, faith, ideology, rituals of worship or social customs, would not be interfered with, non-Muslims would have to accept Muslim rule. Islamic jihad does not recognize their right to administer state affairs according to a system which, in the view of Islam, is evil. Furthermore, Islamic jihad also refuses to admit their right to continue with such practices under an Islamic government which fatally affect the public interest from the viewpoint of Islam. 
non-Muslims would be eligible for all kinds of employment, but must be rigorously excluded from influencing policy decisions, and so not hold key posts in government and elsewhere. They would not have the right to vote in presidential elections or in elections of Muslim representatives. This is to ensure that the basic policy of this ideological state remains in conformity with the fundamentals of Islam. An Islamic Republic may however allow non-Muslims to elect their own representatives to parliament, voting as separate electorates as in the Islamic Republic of Iran. While some might see this as discrimination, Islam has been the most just, the most tolerant and the most generous of all political systems in its treatment of minorities. According to Madhudi, non-Muslims would also have to pay a traditional special tax known as jizya. Under Madhudi's Islamic state, this tax would be applicable to all able-bodied non-Muslim men, elderly, children and women being exempt, in return from their exemption from military service, which all adult Muslim men would be subject to. Those who serve in the military are exempted. Non-Muslims would also be barred from holding certain high-level offices in the Islamic State. Jizya is thus seen as a tax paid in return for protection from foreign invasion, but also as a symbol of Islamic sovereignty. Jews and the Christians should be forced to pay jizya in order to put an end to their independence and supremacy so that they should not remain rulers and sovereigns in the land. These powers should be wrested from them by the followers of the true faith, who should assume the sovereignty and lead others towards the right way. Topic. Jihad Madhudi's first work to come to public attention was Al-Jihad fil Islam, Jihad in Islam, which was serialized in a newspaper in 1927, when he was only 24. In it he maintained that because Islam is all-encompassing, the Islamic State was for all the world and should not be limited to just the homeland of Islam. Jihad should be used to eliminate un-Islamic rule and establish the worldwide Islamic State. Islam wishes to destroy all states and governments anywhere on the face of the earth which are opposed to the ideology and program of Islam, regardless of the country or the nation which rules it. The purpose of Islam is to set up a state on the basis of its own ideology and program, regardless of which nation assumes the role of the standard bearer of Islam or the rule of which nation is undermined in the process of the establishment of an ideological Islamic state. Islam requires the earth, not just a portion, but the whole planet, because the entire mankind should benefit from the ideology and welfare program of Islam. Towards this end, Islam wishes to press into service all forces which can bring about a revolution and a composite term for the use of all these forces is jihad. The objective of the Islamic jihad is to eliminate the rule of an un-Islamic system and establish in its stead an Islamic system of state rule. Madhudi taught that the destruction of the lives and property of others was lamentable part of the great sacrifice of jihad, but that Muslims must follow the Islamic principle that it is better to suffer a lesser loss to save ourselves from a greater loss. Though in jihad, thousands of lives may be lost, this cannot compare to the calamity that may befall mankind as a result of the victory of evil over good and of aggressive atheism over the religion of God. He explained that jihad was not only combat for God but any effort that helped those waging combat, chital, including nonviolent work, in the jihad in the way of Allah, active combat is not always the role on the battlefield, nor can everyone fight in the front line. Just for one single battle preparations have often to be made for decades on end and the plans deeply laid, and while only some thousands fight in the front line there are behind them millions engaged in various tasks which, though small themselves, contribute directly to the supreme effort. At the same time he took a more conservative line on jihad than other revivalist thinkers such as Ayatollah Khomeini and Said Qutb. In general, he argued that jihad should not denote a crazed faith, bloodshot eyes, shouting Allahu Akbar, decapitating an unbeliever wherever they see one, cutting off heads while invoking la ilaha illa llah there is no god but god. During a ceasefire with India in 1948, he opposed the waging of jihad in Kashmir, stating that jihad could be proclaimed only by Muslim governments, not by religious leaders. Topic: <laughs> Mystique, personality, personal life. 
As Jama'a Amir, he remained in close contact with G members, conducting informal discussions every day in his house between Asar and Maghrib Salat prayers, although according to some, in later years discussion was replaced by answers to members' questions with any rebuttals ignored. For his votaries in Jama'a, Madudi was not only a revered scholar, politician, and thinker, but a hallowed mujadid. Adding to his mystic was his survival of assassination attempts, while the Jamaat's enemies Liaquat Ali Khan, Ghulam Muhammad, Hussein Shahid Surawardi, Ayub Khan, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, fell from grace, or were killed. He had a powerful command of Urdu language which he insisted on using, in order to free Muslims' minds from the influence of English. In private, he has been described as strict but not rigid, taciturn, poised, composed, uncompromising, and unyielding. His biographers have talked of his karanat special gifts and haba great presence. His public speaking style has been described as having great authority. Madhudi would make his argument step by step with Islamic edicts rather than attempting to excite his audience with oratory. Although he did not publicize the fact, Madhudi was a practitioner of traditional medicine or Yunani tib. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Family and health. Madhudi has been described as close to his wife, but not able to spend much time with his six sons and three daughters due to his commitments to religious dawa and political action. Only one of his offspring, ever joined the G. And only his second daughter ASMA, showed any scholarly promise. Madhudi suffered from a kidney ailment most of his life. He was often bedridden in 1945 and 1946, and in 1969 was forced to travel to England for treatment. Late life In April 1979, Madhudi's longtime kidney ailment worsened and by then he also had heart problems. He went to the United States for treatment and was hospitalized in Buffalo, New York, where his second son worked as a physician. Following a few surgical operations, he died on of September 1979, at the age of 75. His funeral was held in Buffalo, but he was buried in an unmarked grave at his residence in Itra, Lahore after a very large funeral procession through the city. <inaudible> Legacy In Pakistan, where the G claims to be the oldest religious party it is hard to exaggerate the importance of that country's current drift toward Madhudi's version of Islam. According to scholar Iran Lehrman, his background as a journalist, thinker, scholar and political leader has been compared to Indian independence leader Abul Kalam Azad by admiring biographers. He and his party are thought to have been the most important factors in Pakistan working to generate support for an Islamic state. They are thought to have helped inspire General Zia ul Haq to introduce Shurization to Pakistan. Sharia laws decreed by Zia included bans on interest on loans riba, deduction by the government of 2.5% annual zakat tax from bank accounts, introduction of Islamic punishments such as stoning and amputation with the 1979 Hudud ordinances. One policy of Zia's that was originally proposed by Madhudi, and not found in classic Islamic jurisprudence fiqh, was the introduction of separate electorates for non-Muslims in 1985. In return Madhudi's party was greatly strengthened by Zia with ten thousands of members and sympathizers given jobs in the judiciary and civil service early in Zia's rule. Outside of South Asia, Muslim Brotherhood founder Hassan al-Banna and jihadist Saeed Qutb read him, according to historian Philip Jenkins. Qutb. Borrowed and expanded. Madhudi's concept of Islam being modern, Muslims having fallen into pre-Islamic ignorance jihiliya, and of the need for an Islamist revolutionary vanguard movement. His ideas influenced Abdullah Azam, the Palestinian Islamist jurist and renewer of jihad in Afghanistan and elsewhere. The South Asian diaspora, including significant numbers in Britain, were hugely influenced by Madhudi's work. Madhudi even had a major impact on Shia Iran, where Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini is reputed to have met Madhudi as early as 1963 and later translated his works into Persian. To the present day, Iran's revolutionary rhetoric often draws on his themes. According to Yusuf M. Chowri, all the major contemporary radicalist 
Islamist movements the Tunisian Islamic Tendency, the Egyptian Islamic Jihad Organization, and the Muslim Brotherhood of Syria, "...derive their ideological and political programs," from the writings of Madhudi and Sayyid Qutb. Timeline of Abul Ala Madhudi's life 1903 – Born in Aurangabad, Hyderabad State, British Raj 1918 – Started career as journalist in Bainor newspaper 1920 – Appointed as editor of the Daily Taj, based in Jubalpur 1921 – Learned Arabic from Maulana Abdul Salam Niazi in Delhi 1921 – Appointed as editor Daily Muslim newspaper 1926 took the Sanad of Uloom e Akaliya wa Nakaliya from Darul Uloom Fatehpuri, Delhi. 1928 took the Sanad in Jamay al Tirmidhi and Mu'atta Imam Malik form same teacher. 1925 appointed as editor Al Jamia, Delhi. 1927 wrote Al Jihad fil Islam. 1930 wrote and published the famous booklet Al Jihad fil Islam. 1933 started Tarjaman ul Quran from Hyderabad. 1937 aged 34, introduced to South Asia's premier Muslim poet philosopher, Allama Muhammad Iqbal, by Chaudhry Niaz Ali Khan at Lahore. 1938 aged 35, moved to Pathankot from Hyderabad Deccan and joined the Dar ul Islam Trust Institute, which was established in 1936 by Chaudhry Niaz Ali Khan on the advice of Allama Muhammad Iqbal for which Chaudhry Niaz Ali Khan donated 66 acres square meters of land from his vast 1,000-acre estate in Jamalpur, 5 km west of Pathankot. 1941 founded Jamaat-e-Islami Hind at Lahore, appointed as Amir 1942 Jamaat's headquarters moved to Pathankot 1942 started writing a commentary of the Quran called Tafhim ul Quran 1947 Jamaat-e-Islami Pakistan headquarters moved to Lahore, Pakistan 1948 Campaign for Islamic Constitution and Government 1948 – Thrown in jail by the Pakistani government for fatwa on jihad in Kashmir 1949 – Pakistani government accepted Jamaat's resolution for Islamic constitution 1950 – Released from jail 1953 – Sentenced to death for his historical part in the agitation against Ahmadiyya to write a booklet Qadiani problem. He was sentenced to death by a military court, but it was never carried out. 1953 death sentence commuted to life imprisonment and later cancelled. 1958 Jamaat e Islami banned by martial law administrator Field Marshal Ayub Khan. 1964 sentenced to jail. 1964 released from jail. 1971 in the question of United Pakistan or separation of the East Pakistan later Bangladesh he relinquished his authority to East Pakistan Shura consultative body of Jamaat. 1972 – Completed Tafhim ul Quran 1972 – Resigned as Amir-e-Jamaat 1978 – Published his last book, Sirat-e-Sarwar-e-Alam, in two volumes. 1979 – Won King Faisal International Prize 1979 – Left for the United States for a medical treatment 1979 – Died in Buffalo, United States 1979 buried in Itra, Lahore Topic. Selected bibliography Madhudi had produced 73 books at the time of his death, written more than 120 books and pamphlets, and made more than 1,000 speeches and press statements. His magnum opus was the 30 Years in Progress translation tafsir in Urdu of the Quran, Tafhim ul Quran, the meaning of the Quran, intended to give the Quran a self-claim interpretation. It became widely read throughout the South Asia and has been translated into several languages, some of his books translated into English. 
Jihad in Islam towards understanding Islam Purda and the status of women in Islam The Islamic law and constitution Let us be Muslims The Islamic way of life The meaning of the Quran A short history of the revivalist movement in Islam Human rights in Islam Four basic Quranic terms The process of Islamic revolution Unity of the Muslim world The moral foundations of the Islamic movement Economic system of Islam The road to peace and salvation The Qadiani problem The question of dress The rights of non-Muslims in Islamic State topic See also Islamic schools and branches Naim Siddiqui Tariq e Islami Contemporary Islamic Philosophy topic References topic Notes topic Citations topic Books and articles Adams, Charles J. Madhudi and the Islamic State. In Esposito, John L. Voices of Resurgent Islam. Oxford University Press. ISBN 9780195033403. Khan, Faisal, the 22nd of December 2015. Islamic Banking in Pakistan: Sharia Compliant Finance and the Quest to Make Pakistan More Islamic. Routledge. ISBN 9781317367. Khan, Faisal, the 22nd of July 2017. Curran, Timur, 2004. Islam and Mammon: The Economic Predicaments of Islamism. Princeton University Press. ISBN 1400837359. Khan, Faisal. The 23rd of July 2017. Ahmad, K. Ed. N. D. Ahmad, K. Ed. Economic System of Islam. Translated by Hussain, R. Lahore, Islamic Publications. Retrieved the 1st of March 2018. Madudi, S. Abul Al. 1977. The Islamic Law and Constitution PDF. Horsheed Ahmad, translator and editor. Lahore. Nasser, Sayyid Valley Reza 1996. Madhudi and the Making of Islamic Revivalism. Oxford University Press. ISBN 978-0-19-535711-0. Nasser, Sayyid Valley Reza 1994. The Vanguard of the Islamic Revolution, the Jama at I Islami of Pakistan. University of California Press. ISBN 9780520083653. Khan, Faisal. The 23rd of July 1971. External links Website dedicated to Madhudi Saeed Abul Allah Madhudi Al Quran Project includes Abul Allah Madhudi's translation with Madhudi's Tafhim al Quran in English Towards Understanding the Quran Official Site Towards Understanding the Quran Madhudi Response Download Madhudi's works Download English translations of many books by Madhudi Download Bengali translations of many books by Madhudi